I need like a sticky note. Sally, you're just going to stay with me for the rest of the day and remind me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So one of the first things that you definitely want to do is hide the side. And what I mean by that is in any of your courses, you have all of this course navigation over here on your left. And if you leave that open, then students can click. They will get lost. It is a guarantee. I don't care if they are in second grade or if they are a senior in high school, they're going to get lost. So an easy thing that you can do in any course is go to your settings and don't be scared of that. You're going to see us going to settings quite a bit. You are not going to break Canvas. Even if you delete something, you can get it back. No matter what people tell you, you can get it back. So don't, don't freak out, okay? Um, but in settings, there is a tab up here at the top called navigation. And so with navigation, you can tell Canvas what you want your students to see. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't access it still as a teacher. You have that option but your students will not be able to see it. So you have the option of dragging and dropping, as you can see that I'm doing here, or you can click on the stoplight and disable. So once you kind of have the menu at where you want it to be, then you can click save at the bottom. I will tell you that in most of my courses, I have four things typically visible for students. I have home, of course, you can't get rid of that. Modules, because we'll talk about why you want modules in a second at announcements and grades. And that's usually all I'll leave for them. Now, if you are, you know, a Google district, you can have Google Drive appear for them. If you're Discovery Ed or Flipgrid, if you're using any of those things, absolutely, you may wanna have those visible. But I definitely hide syllabus and people and quizzes and assignments and pages because it just takes them a different path and it can be, uh, they can get lost a lot quicker. So that is definitely the first tip. You'll notice that throughout this presentation, everything is linked. And so when it's linked, it walks you through those directions. All right. Now, another thing that you can do is utilize the calendar. A lot of folks don't do this, and I highly encourage you to. If you have an assignment, and so I'll make one for today. I'm just gonna call it homework. So once you make an ass any assignment, quiz, um, or discussion, anything that has a due date, it will automatically populate on your calendar. And it does this for students as well. However, sometimes you need to go in and change the due date because something happens, you get snow like we do in um, Watauga County, you just need to change the date. Well, instead of actually going back into that assignment to change it, an easier option is to come to calendar and you can simply drag and drop to a new date. What that will then do is that will update it in Canvas. It will update it for students and parents there in the Observer app. And if you are syncing to Power Teacher Pro, it will update it in Power Teacher Pro for you. So just by that simple drag and drop, now it's a, everything's updated across the board and I didn't have to go in and edit. You can also go month to month. So if I needed to move this assignment to August, I can change the August calendar at the top and I can simply drop that on that new date and it's there. So that's just a really great way to quickly make changes. Some other things, I get asked this question quite a bit, um, is in dashboard for navigation, there are different ways that you can actually view. So if you prefer a list view, it has kind of like your calendar for the day. Some students prefer that view. You can do recent activity or your card view. Now, another thing is that you may be starting and you have this funky overlay where you're going, I have a picture, but it just, I don't like the way that that looks. You can come to those three dots in the very top right corner and turn off co cover uh, color overlay. So it just makes it nice and pretty. Some other things that you can do are, when you get those courses from Tower Teacher Pro, it has that really long funky name. And you're like, I don't know what that means. On any of your course tiles, you can click the three dots and notice that you can give it a nickname. So you can call it first period. You can call it, you know, math one, whatever is easiest for you to understand. This is just for your 
sake, you can also change the color. It doesn't apply to students. Students can change the name too if they needed help with that. Um, but for your sake, if you, it's easier for you to have a different name scheme than the like long name for PowerSchool, you can change that in the nickname. It doesn't change it anywhere else. It just makes it easier for you to understand. Okay, so those are some options there that you have for updating the navigation, always hiding that side, looking at your calendar and cleaning up your dashboard is really easy. Now, if this past year was your very first year using Canvas, I wanted to point this out because the folks always go, well, where do all my courses go? You can always access any past courses by going to courses and all courses at the bottom. This is gonna bring up any courses that you have been previously enrolled in. If you have courses that for some reason you're just not using Canvas, which is fine, you can star the ones by clicking that star. And those are the courses that will only display on your dashboard. So if you wanna clean up your dashboard, that's a quick and easy way to only have the ones you want to remain visible. Another great feature is announcements. I wanna kind of talk a little bit about this. Okay. Um, announcements are a great way to get information out to all your students at once. So, you know, previously you may have set up an email list group and you maybe have forgot to update it with new students or students that have left. So within Canvas, you can create an announcement so I'll do one here and say, you know, call it welcome. You can actually add in images, links, files. Um, if you're using O365 or Google Drive, you have those options to bring in anything linked to stuff within Canvas, all that great stuff. And then you can send it out to your students. What's cool is you can also delay posting. So if you want to do it later in the week, you can do that. This will go out to all of your students and it will go as a notification to their email as well as be in the course. So by saving and sending, it's going to go out to all of my students, but I can also house my announcements on my home page. So let me show you what that looks like. You can do this by going to settings and then scroll into the bottom. And then there's this little thing that says more options. Lots of good stuff there. All right, so under more options, you'll see, hey, do you want to show announcements on the homepage? You want that checked? And maybe I only want to show one announcement at a time. Now update. So what will happen is that when students go home, any new announcements will now display at the very top. And so it's just a great way to have that communication with students. And you're not having to worry about updating um, any email listservs. Also, if you parents or observers in it, they can see those announcements as well. So it's just a great communication tool all built in together. Now, we're going to pause for a second. So looking at both navigation and announcements, are there, is there a cool way that you've already used one of these two things? Or is there something new that you've taken away and you're like, wow, I didn't know that. So either you can unmute yourself or you can pop that in the chat. Let's share out what are some ways that we have thought about or have already used navigation or announcements. All right, so Cynthia says she uses the daily announcement. Great, yeah, it can get folks started. You could put in um, a Google Meet code if you needed to. Awesome, or even a Q&A for students for um, assignments, great. The option to um, star so that you can clean up your dashboard because mine is like, where I, where I haven't started using it yet. So I've got some imports and different things. So that's awesome so that I can clear some of that out but still keep keep it in the background. Yes, that star feature. That's I, Usually people are like, oh, I gotta use Canvas. And then you start using it and you're like, how do I clean it up? Well, the star feature is definitely the way to go. Awesome. All right, Pamela said she uses announcements and school wide to send out weekly broadcasts. Yes, if you are um, an admin in Canvas, you can actually send out school wide or district wide announcements. So that can be really helpful. So question was, when students read the announcements, does it tell a teacher that it has been read or not? Um, not necessarily, like if they, if they click on announcements in the course, then yes, you can pull that data. But if they're just reading it through their email, 
or if they're just reading on the, on the top of the homepage, not, not necessarily. Um, so sometimes a great thing is you can have them reply. So, so see where it says they can reply. Sometimes I'll put like a, you can do like a little Easter egg where like, Hey, if you read this, say yes. And then you can get a homework pass or whatever it is you want to. And then you can see who has replied. So you can kind of turn it to a little game if you wanted to. Okay, great thought. All right. Now we're going to move into modules. Um, I told this to my session this morning. If you're not using modules, that is the number one way that I recommend you actually design your courses. It makes it really easy for students to follow. It, the organization is easier. And there's some cool things that you can do within Canvas. So let's look at modules here. Modules are essentially like a file folder system here. And you can create different types of modules um, and you can put different information in them. So let me go here. So you can see how you can have them stacked out and they're, everything's looking nice, but you can also add in information like text header so you can break apart a module to make it a little bit easier to understand you can add in monday you can add um so here's like days of the week where you can break it apart for your students you could do it by unit you can really help organize and add your intentions some other things that you can do with modules are if you click the stoplight once you've created a module and edit then you can add requirements. So you can say that students must move through all of these requirements. They must go in sequential order. So then they can't just click to go to the next thing. You can even say they, this is what they must do. So if they're viewing this page, they must mark as done. Um, they must contribute to the discussion post. They must actually submit. If they're taking a quiz, they must score at least this. So you can do all of those things and it will keep track of it for you. The, how it keeps track is at the very top, there is view progress. So this is a great way. Maybe you have um, students doing some independent work as one of their stations and their rotations, and you're working with other students face-to-face, -face. then they could be working on it and Canvas is gonna track where they're at in their progress. So you can go student by student, and these are teachers. These are not actual students. So I'm not showing you any student data here, but I can see for Angela that it's in progress. She still has these two items left to complete, okay? So I did see the question of, well, hey, how did you get text headers and emojis? Don't worry. How you can do that um, is you can create a new module. I'm just gonna say week one. And there are some keyboard shortcuts. You can either go to, as, as Jen put in there, cause she was in my earlier session, there's emojipedia.org. Or if you are on a um, PC, you can do a shortcut called the Windows key and a period, and a full emoji keyboard will appear. Or if you're on a MacBook, I'm trying to remember my keys, I think it's command space period. But um, if I wanted to put a blue dot, I could type blue, it's going to find the emoji that works for me. And I can add, or you can copy and paste from Emojipedia. All this does is it gets you a little bit more information, a little bit more color. To add text headers, you can go to any module and click plus. From the drop down menu, you have the option for a text header. Now, I like to put mine in all caps. That's just because it, it stands out a little bit more, but it could be essential questions. It could be I can or I will statements. Um, in this case, I'm doing days of the week, but it could be resources. It could be you know independent work, however you want to label it. It just makes it a little bit easier for students to look at. Now, as I'm scrolling, you're going to see, well, gosh, it, it takes a lot to get to all of these things. A little tip for about modules is at the very top, you have collapse all. If you hit collapse all, it's going to collapse all of your modules, and then you can quickly just see them by their headers. Another tip is that if we are completely done with the module, for my students, I actually unpublish. So it doesn't display for them. So in a student view, I'll show this to you. Notice I only have a few modules actually published. So they don't have, they don't have all the same modules that I had. So in this case, they only had four modules um, that I want them to see at a time. And that's just a great way to, again, to keep students on track and not overwhelmed. You can always come back and quickly publish at any time by clicking that little button. 
So there's some links here to how you insert text headers and prerequisites and requirements, some great things to take control of your course and let Canvas do the work for you. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is links. When you're working in Canvas, and for many of you guys, you probably um, have actually already built out some materials that you are using and you wanna use them again, which is great. But there's this little button and I tell all my teachers at the beginning of the year when you import everything over. So when you go into your new course, you can come right here and say, import existing content and bring copy a whole course over. The first thing you wanna do <laughs> is go right here to settings and over on the right hand side, there is this button, it's called validate links and content. And when you click it, and it's gonna take a second, but what it will do is it will go through your entire course and find any broken links. So if that YouTube video is no longer on YouTube, it's gonna tell you. So you can quickly at the beginning of the year or beginning of the semester, go through and see, oh, is there anything that's not working? So I don't have to wait until we get ready to go in and learn this lesson. And the students say, you know, Ms. Cardwell, that link's not working anymore. I don't know what to do. And I'm having to come up with a plan B. You can be proactive and see it and ready to go. And I could go and fix all of these links that were broken, okay? So again, that was in settings. And over on the right-hand side, validate links and content. And it will go through your entire course. If you have a lot of content, it's gonna take a few minutes. <laughs> it's gonna take a few, but it'll get through it. So that's just an, a nice little um, detail there. Some other things I want to mention are that depending on, here we go, depending on, um, I'll use this page right here. Most of your districts should have turned on the new rich content editor because the old one has died, but I know some folks were able to kind of keep it alive for a little bit longer. But in your new rich content editor, that's this thing right here, you have some really great options. One of them is that you can actually upload your files. So you can bring in a file. And I think I have, I believe I have something. Uh, Greg Apsey, okay. So I can bring in a PDF for my students to see, but if I want them to, I, I want it to actually open up so that they can see it fully, I can click on that link and notice there's options now. And options, I can say inline and expand. So watch what will happen. That will do that little flash save. And now what, when students come to this page, that PDF will automatically open up and this lets display for my students. So that's just a great little inline preview. It makes it easier if um, that's what you're, you're wanting them to do. Apparently that was a pretty big PDF file. <laughs> so hopefully the preview will come in. So that's one option there with the inline previews. Um, some other options that you have, and these are, there you go. So then students can zoom in some great features, all that good stuff. I do see we have some new folks who have just joined us. I'm gonna put the link to the presentation right there for you all in the chat. All right, some other things that you can do are that you can actually duplicate your content. And this is huge. So um, if you are, you have kind of a template a way that you like that it looks like I do these things in class and Monday, Thursday, you have kind of a template set in a module, then you can always come to a module and you can duplicate an entire module. Um, you can also send to, so if you've worked on a module and you want to share it to a, a colleague, you can send it to that person and then they can grab it and put it in their course. And you can even copy to another course. So if you're teaching this, but you want it to go to another course after you built it, you can do it that way. You can also do individual items. You can send to or copy to. Um, and in some cases, I think that one was a, I hadn't finished it yet, but you can also duplicate items as well. So you can do that from modules. You can also do it by going straight to assignments. it loads. There you go. So you can find something 
that you wanted to and you can duplicate. So right there, duplicate. So Mandy asked the send to option is just that they, it's just a copy. It makes a copy of it and goes to that person and then they can make changes, yes. Um, but it doesn't change your original. So an option that some folks have is when they wanna be updated across the board, they can um, work with their district and do blueprint courses as, and that kind of, you can make a master and then it'll duplicate out for everyone and those you can't change necessarily. A great question. So those are some options that you have right there within links. Um, another option is this one called the redirect tool, one of my favorites. So let me show you what the redirect tool is. It's actually an app. You can get apps for Canvas by going to settings. And then you'll notice you have an apps button. And this app is called redirect. And you'll see a blue arrow. What this app will let you do is it will let you put any link over here on your course navigation. Now you don't want to fill up your course navigation with a bunch of stuff, but let's say that my students always go to IXL. Like they go to IXL as part of their math stations every day. And I don't want to have to keep posting the link. I can copy and paste the link and give it a name. And then I need to do, check this box right here, show in course navigation. When I do that and I add the app, and I refresh, right there, it now appears IXL. So students can simply click and it will take them to that link. So the redirect is a great way when you have some of those external links that aren't integrated within Canvas and they go, you go to it very frequently, like every, at least every week, you can put them right there on the course navigation and it makes it super easy for students to find. Okay, so I'm gonna pause before we get to submissions. We just talked about modules and links. So what ideas or um, other tips would you guys like to share with the group? You can either uh, unmute yourself, you can add it into the chat, um, but what are some things that you've taken away or things that you've used that you're like, I absolutely love this. So feel free to share. Hey, um, this is Cynthia. Um, I used Canvas for the first time last year, you know, and of course it was that quick push to put everything on and, and do all the things. And I did pretty well, except I don't know how to use um, like speed grader or put, have it sent to my power school. Mm -hmm. So is there a good, I mean, it was grading things for me, but then I was just transferring it myself. I didn't know how to link things. I didn't know how to set up my grade book for the two to, to talk to one another or however that works exactly. Is there a good video or a good resource that I can use to figure this out? Yeah, it's going <laughs> to be that's, that's my big goal for next year. And there was nothing offered about how to use yeah. Speed grader. Yeah. So I, I will get into all that in like, I don't know, slide 10 or whatever the slide number is. Okay. So okay. I'll cover that for you all. Perfect. Yes. Thank absolutely. You. All right. So Michelle said, I love the idea that I can put an external link like Desmos. Yes. And Michelle, just so you know, you can fully embed Desmos into all the quizzes. So your students can use them just like they do on the EOCs and EOGs people. It's great. Um, and you can put it right. Like you can embed Desmos activities right within campus. It's great. All right, so text headers, yes. If you're not organizing your modules with text headers, it makes it so much nicer. So please do. <laughs> All right, so next up we have submissions. Some new things that have come out, you may not be familiar with, so I wanna show you what they look like. And as um, David Rose says, I'm obsessed when this came out because the number one issue we had is like when you, you have K-12 students submitting, they don't always know to click the submit button and I know that sounds crazy, but how many of you guys had students who were like, I think I submitted. I don't know if I submit. And then it's just like back and forth. And you're like, you didn't submit. And they're like, yes, I did. So Canvas actually overhauled all of that. And they launched it last January um, in beta. It, this may not be on yet in your, in your district, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, 
have your admin turn it on. It's amazing. So let me show you what it looks like. It's actually called the student enhanced assignments. So I think I put trying to find the course that I did a demo in. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. So what it actually looks like is when students submit something and I'll go, I'll, I'll do it through a student view so that you can see it. Is it makes it so much easier. So depending on how you have your students submit, it's going to tell students you are in progress. If you give them multiple attempts, what attempt it is. And then students can simply click on, oh, I'm going to do text. Now I'm going to do link. Or if you click upload more options, here's how they can submit their Google. So or O365, if you have that integration. So it's right there for students. It makes it super easy. For this purpose, I'm just going to say that was my, my submission. And I can then say right here, submit assignment. So it's no longer at the top. It's right at the bottom. It saves their draft. So if they get kicked out or something, it's already saved for them. They click submit. And then look, it tells them, hey, you submitted this. And it's great. Um, if you have, they can easily view their feedback. Everything's there in one location. So I highly recommend turning on, it's called student enhanced assignments. Um, if you're not sure if it's on or not, you can always go to settings. Well, I gotta be our student view first, hold on. <laughs> so settings, and then you have feature previews and assignments enhancement students. So you can see if that's on for you or not. Um, if you're not seeing that at all, you probably want to ask your Canvas admin or you know whoever it is in your district to get that turned on because it's amazing. Um, it kind of gives this like little line preview where it walks the students through each step. And so it's really great. And if you weren't familiar, I showed this to the earlier group, student annotations are now a part of um, online submissions. So you can upload a PDF and then students can annotate right on it, right within Canvas. So you don't have to use Kami or any of those other resources. It's all built right within Canvas for you now. So super great. All right, grades. <laughs> um, I get asked this question quite a bit about grades, but some things that you can do to make your life easier. So let's talk about that. One of the things that you can do to make your life easier is use rubrics. Um, if you're not familiar with a rubric, let me grab one. Real quick, so. Getting there, sorry guys. There we go, speed writer. Okay. Um, so you can add a rubric to any assignment or even discussion. And you, if you have built a rubric, you can find one that you would like to use. And then it puts it right in there. The reason why rubrics are so much easier is that when you go into speed grader, and so anytime you grade something in Canvas, you can use what's called speed grader to grade it. You can then just, it's an enhanced rubric. So when this loads, there we go. I can view rubric and I can kind of go click, 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 because I know my rubric and save. And then that score will automatically populate in my grade book based off of the rubric. And it will then, if you are syncing to Power Teacher Pro, it will automatically populate there for you. So it makes it really easy to go through. Um, the reason why I like using rubrics are if you have the Canvas Teacher app, you can use that on a smart device, a tablet, and it's literally a click, click, click. Some other things that you can do when you are grading are that you can give feedback. You can do a um, video of yourself or a voice comment. And this is new, this launched this summer, is you have a full comment library that you can add to. So if you have some of those same um, pieces of feedback that you give to folks, you can use those over and over again. And you can 
find those right within your comment library. So again, if you're not seeing that feature, talk to your Canvas admin, that should be turned on for everyone because it's amazing, love it. Um, so again, there's the resources for it. Now, if you are like me, where you kind of have a lot of people and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. There's an option in your speed grader. You can do this at any time. You can click the gear and go to options and default it's it shows your grade book by our your speed grader by um name but i always change mine to by submission status and the reason i do that is so that when i'm clicking through it's only showing the kids that have submitted so i'm not having to click through some a lot of blank ones and i can know that they've submitted because i see the yellow dot but see all these that haven't submitted i might have to go through it if it's by their name but in this case i can literally click through each student that has submitted. So again, in SpeedGrader, that gear right there in options, and there are keyboard sh shortcuts if you're a shortcut person to, to help with that. But those are pretty awesome features. Another feature that is great is in your gradebook. And, and it's one of those things that I don't like about Canvas, and I don't know why they do it this way, but maybe it's just my brain doesn't work this way, is in your gradebook. And again, these are all teacher demos. so. I'm not showing any data here. They put the total column at the end. <laughs> and I hate that because I'm like, no, I want to see my kids overall grade. So what you can do, my grade book's still loading because there's too many kids in this class. There we go. Come on. You can click your the three dots here and tell it to move to the front. And so that's going to move your total column all the way to the front. So as it does it, it's going to take its time right there. <laughs> It'll go. So now I can see my students' overall grades. Some other things that you have here, and I highly recommend you do this, is you can view. So um, as you switch nine weeks, you can view just by the nine weeks. You can also add filters. Um, if you are wanting to, you can view by assignment groups, or if you're working on a, sp a specific unit or by the week, you can actually view your gradebook only by modules. And so you can tell it um, to only show that module. So you're only going to see the grades for that particular module. And that just sometimes helps make it a little easier to grade and see how students are doing. Um, another question I get asked quite a bit is how do you view individual student grades? You can always come to gradebook and individual view or you can click on a student and the context card will appear this gives you lots of great information about the student participation really easy access to new analytics so their participation there but if you click on grades it will actually show you the student view so like this is what students see when they go to their grades okay so you can see it does tell them if they're missing an assignment it does tell them if it's late i know we've had students who are like no that's not happening it does do that. So there's just some great options that you have right there in your gradebook and in SpeedGrader that I highly recommend and it will save you so much time. Okay, um, another great feature in your gradebook. And this one is one of my favorites. And this is message students too. You can also do this in new analytics. But um, I've, I found it's kind of easy to do it right here. And that is if you have this assignment and you click your three dots, um, you can set a default grade. So you can do that just like you do in Power Teacher Pro. Um, you can go right to Speed Grader, sort by, all that good stuff. But there's a button here called Message Students Who. And so what you can do is anybody who hasn't submitted, if they scored less than, haven't been graded, or even scored more than. And I, I like this feature because maybe I have one, one student, then I can give some positive feedback. This goes to their Canvas inbox and their, um, their notification to their email. They don't see the other students on it. So if I have this many who haven't submitted, I can just say, hi, you are currently missing this assignment. Um, please you know, submit as soon as possible so I can get your grade in. They don't see all the other students that are a part of that. So it's a really quick, easy way for you to communicate. And all of that's documented for you in your inbox. So you can then say, hey, yes, I've communicated with the student X times. 
Um, but it's just that one click here, message students to. It's a great feature. All right, so I'm gonna pause. We just talked about submissions and the new student enhanced assignments um, and, and the annotations. We talked about the grade books. What things have you either loved about some of these features or that you've used to help you out that you would like to share with others or just questions you have so far? And again, you can feel free to pop it in the chat or unmute yourself. Yes, the message students who feature is phenomenal. It's a great, easy way and it doesn't take a lot of time for, for you to do. So uh, Canvas does that work for you. The comment library, yes. Um, so if you're exactly, Pamela, if you're giving that same comment over and over again, put it in your comment library and just go click and <laughs> you're done. Um, so that's a nice feature. Uh, so Cynthia, we'll talk about those PowerSchool and when we get to that slide, you'll see it. There's a whole slide on PowerFeature Pro. <laughs> All right, guys, so continuing on. <clears throat> new quizzes. So a couple of things that um, are happening just so that you are aware. We are kind of in the transition. Canvas is phasing out what is known as classic quizzes. So this past year, you may have seen where it says, do you want to make a new quiz? Do you want to make a classic quiz? The classic quiz quizzes will be dead next summer. Okay, so you have a whole nother year. So don't no one freak out. You're good. Um, but you may want to start to transitioning over to new quizzes. And so I'm going to show you what that looks like. Some of the great features that you have um, by going to new quizzes, uh, as well as some things to be aware of. Okay. So I do have one in here. And I think I put in there like you can, if you were joined me with the mastery paths, this is an example one that you can take. But let me reset. <laughs> All right, so what new quizzes allows um, you to do is to make more technology enhanced items. And what I mean by that is these are some of the items that you would have uh, that you can actually make. You can make drag and drop. So I'm just gonna, I know this isn't right, but we're just gonna pretend it is. So you can do a drag and drop question. Um, you can do a hotspot question where students actually kind of plot out that point. Um, you can do an ordering question. So you can put them in order. Um, this is my favorite, it's the stimulus. So you can have students either watch a video, read a passage, and then they go through and they answer different questions. So it's a very similar look to the um, EOCs or ERGs. And you have all the other question types that you love. So you have matching, multiple choice, true, false. You have um, formula and essay. All of those things are still there. It just is kind of in a new, more robust way. Now, question is, will you lose all your other stuff? No, you won't. Everything will be migrated over. But in the meantime, what you can do is if you're wanting to take a quiz and make it into new quizzes, you can go to quizzes here in any course. And I'm just gonna take one right here. You can click the three dots and migrate. So what migrating will do is it will then turn it into a new quiz. Now, if you have imported these quizzes from like ExamV Pro or um, any other, some of those other platforms, go back and look at the questions just because anytime you migrate, if there's a picture or something, it could break. So I always tell folks to go back and check, but all your stuff will be migrated for you. So you're not gonna lose anything, but I just wanna give you a heads up that there are some really great question types that you wanna try out in new quizzes, but you're gonna wanna start to make that transition over. And there's some great things that you can do with new quizzes that you couldn't do with classic quizzes before. 
So here's that course if you just want to take that quiz to see what it looks like. It's in the NC DPI. And then here are the directions for how you can migrate over. And yes, as Michelle said, there's a great um, session. I think it's Let's Get Quizzical. So uh, I think Pam Bachelor did it maybe. Um, then she's walking you through. It's a whole session on new quizzes. But that's all there for you. So just as a heads up, it's there. There's some really great things that um, I think new quizzes are going to bring to the, the platform that we didn't really have before. Um, one of those things before I forget, because I do want to show you. One of those um, things is that you can vary questions by point, shuffle questions, shuffle answer choices, um, and you can align it to outcomes, which you can make your outcomes a standard. So you can align all your questions to standards, um, and that makes it really easy to pull out. So it's nice. All right. Um, this one is always, I guess, if I had to rank them, this is probably like the second most asked question. It was, how do you make your canvas pretty? And <laughs> For some folks, they don't really care about that. If you don't care about it, then you can just play around in your own course while I talk about it. But for some folks, they go, wait a second, I wanna make buttons and I wanna make things pretty. So I'm gonna show you the quick and easy version of how to do this. Um, in any of my courses, I'll just take this one for a second. I like adding buttons. So you can see I just played around here, but I like adding buttons and it just makes it easy for um, folks. It's a visual cue. And I think that that is helpful for students, no matter if they're kindergarten or they're in a senior in high school, a visual cue can be super helpful. That's not to say you can't have a great course and you don't use any of this stuff, okay? So you can, that's def definitely doable. But if you wanna kind of make it a little bit cleaner looking and you wanna have some of these visuals, you can do that. All these things are, are they're just pictures. There's nothing fancy about it. It's literally a picture. I'm gonna give you my cheat sheet for all my pictures. The other thing is I put things into a table. Now in Canvas, when you are working with a table, it kind of comes over with these black lines and that can be kind of ugly. Um, so you can always go to your table properties here and give the border a zero. And that just takes away that, so it's just, it's there, but people can't see it. So to make a button, you will create a, a picture um, and you can find ready-made pictures and I'll show you some of those. Uh, in this case, I have some pictures. So I'm gonna go to upload my picture here. Um, trying to find the right button here. We'll do this one. Okay. So let's pretend that this is the button. And boom, there it goes. There's a picture. You can resize by dragging and dropping, or you can click image options and you can give it a size. Notice that lock there. It's going to lock a ratio in. And you can center your button, all the same things that you've typically done before. The thing that you wanna to do to make it a live button is when you click on it, you want to come up here to your links and choose course links. This will link to anything in your course. Now you can also link to an external link. Like if you want them to go Excel, you could do that. But if you want them to go to a specific module, then I can click that module. It's gonna flash. And now when I save, when students click on that, it's going to take them right to that module. So again, that's just an easy way. And that's all a button is. Now we get into the design <laughs> elements of it. Now you can go find pretty pictures and be fine. You're good. But if you just want something clean, but you're not like super picky, um, there's a website called The Button Factory. And it's really easy. You literally put in your text. So I could say unit, there we go, unit one. Um, I can choose my color here. And there it is. And I can download that picture and then upload it into Canvas. So you can do it just like that as an easy one. Or you can go to the most beautiful website ever, which is called Canva. And I think there's a whole session on Canva. Um, and you can create a custom size 
or you can search for Canvas and you can see there are now templates ready to go for a banner and a button. And these will work right within um, in Canvas. And so you can find free ones and all that good stuff. And then you can tweak it and edit it and make it what you want it to look like. Um, I will tell you though some lessons learned here about buttons. There we go. Um, you definitely want to be aware of the fonts that you're using. The more curly Q you use, it can be very difficult for students to read. The colors you're using, you want to make it as easy to read as possible. This orange, I probably wouldn't use. So you want to have some very contrasting colors that's easy to read for students. The other thing is when you're putting your images in, because there is a screen reader under image options, it's going to say alternate text. So in this case, I may put like step one so that the reader will read that text. Okay. So you have those options. Now, um, Jake Standish at CMS made this really cool tool that's a Chrome extension and you can just drag and drop buttons. So that's an option there. You see a link to the button factory in Canva. And then I've had um, a cheat sheet for sizes. I like Canva stuff, but I also like my own kind of <laughs> designs. Um, and so these are just some of the sizes that you can put in and, and this is what it will look like. So these are all some cheat sheets for you. Um, and there's some ready-made templates and you can always go to commons and we'll talk about that in a little bit more in a minute, but the commons you can go and find from other teachers that I've created and let it go and, and just have fun with it. So those are some options there. I would not spend a ton of time making your homepage pretty. If you're spending a lot of time making your homepage pretty, you're spending too much time. Um, something else I noticed last year happened and I'm, I'm gonna get some flat for it. So it's okay, you can throw your tomatoes at me. Last year, the Bitmoji classroom kind of took over, which is a cool thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not hating on Bitmoji classroom, but folks were putting it then in Canvas and you're kind of trying to do multiple things and it wasn't as easy for students to navigate. So if that's what you're kind of looking for, I don't know that I would make that your homepage. It may be a link to it. It was easier for students than they were trying to navigate to it on their device. Um, so just be aware of some of those things when you are designing. It's not just for your eyes, it's for all eyes. And you may have some students with visual impairments. So what's the easiest thing for them? There you go. All right, um, we are gonna move into Google. And this is very similar for O365, but I do wanna mention this Google piece because if you were using Google Docs cloud assignment last year, that has died. And it is now Google Assignments. The good news is it is the exact same look and feel as Google Classroom. So if you are one of those folks who um, you got brought over to Canvas and you were like, I want to use Google Classroom, I don't want to use Canvas, you're, the good news is, is that you basically can now use Google Classroom within Canvas. It works. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. So um, in this one, I have what it will look like for you as a teacher is that once you uh, do the external tool with Google LTI, then it walks you through just like you do in Google Classroom. Um, and then I can still see my students submit. It comes to me live and then I can return it back to them. So you can see I don't have any returns yet. Um, and then you can still keep going through. You do have to grade here in Canvas for this one. Um, it doesn't seek to speed greater yet. Um, Google keeps saying they're gonna come with that. I've not heard an update on that, but you can grade right here. It goes into your gradebook in Canvas, that works, and it does sync to Power Teacher Pro. But you have all of the things that you want. The other thing that people often ask for is a, a plagiarism detector. And with Google Assignments, it is built in and you can actually turn that on. This is where you can make a template in your Google Drive. And then boom, it makes a copy for all of your students. So you, this is the option. If your students are creating a product in Google from scratch, you don't have to use Google assignments. They can just submit right like a normal file within, um, within Canvas and you can still view it. So those are some options, but these are the things that are new. And if you're an O365 district, be aware um, of what your integration does.
time. So I'm going to pause there before I get to Cynthia's question about Power Teacher Pro. So what we just talked about was new quizzes, buttons, making things pretty, and then Google. So again, what are some takeaways? What are some ways that you've already been using these features that you would like to share out with other folks? Well, I'm glad it's helpful. Awesome. <laughs> Anybody have something they're like, wow, I didn't know that, or hey, I've been using that and that has been really helpful because it's always great to hear from each other. Or hopefully, am I hitting the nail on the head? I guess is the question. Are you getting what you need to from this session? Okay, awesome. Well, then I'll keep going, but feel free. We'll have some time in just a few minutes for questions. All right. Power Teacher Pro. <laughs> okay. So if your district integrates with PowerSchool, that's the first question you need to ask is, do they integrate? The reason why I'm saying that is a few districts came on board to Canvas last year for the first time, and they were unable to get this working. There's a different thing that they're going to do, but that's where we're at. But a lot of districts across the state have been using Canvas for years. So uh, this is what you can do to get it to work. So I have included all of the links, but basically if you go to this quick start guide, this is what I make, I made for my teachers. And I'm like, okay, these are the things that you need to know. So when you click on it, it's going to walk you through step-by-step -step how to make sure um that everything's working and that's just I, I wish i could show you but i don't have any live student data to take it over but you do have to follow the steps and those steps are importing your assignment groups from power teacher pro to canvas and then making sure your assignments in canvas are in those groups once you do that the sync is it just kind of works if a sync ever breaks you can always remaster the sync and it just really quickly builds it back out. And that fixes, no lie, 99% of the problems. Um, so often I get folks who say, this is broken, it's not working. And um, on one of these things right here, the remaster, this, if they click that, then everything works back and it's great. <laughs> okay, so these are just some helpful tips and tricks to help with that Power Teacher Pro and everything to know. If your district came on board last year, I'm gonna use Surrey County, for example, because I know they did for a fact, um, they were unable to get their sync to work. They're working on some other things with Canvas, but like these directions will not work. But again, most of the state had already gone to Canvas prior to that. So I think you, you will be okay. All right, so some last few things um, that I wanna mention, even though we've talked about a lot of stuff in canvas okay so let's say i have this lovely page here um i'll go here and delete one now sometimes you're working and you're like oh yeah that's great and you you don't think you need something so you're like yeah i'm gonna delete it i'm good and then you realize that was my original though that was i need that i need to get it back how do you get stuff back in any canvas course you can go to home and after the numbers at the top if you put slash undelete it will bring up the last 25 items that you deleted and you can restore okay so nothing is ever permanently deleted it's there now if you delete your course, which it asks you, y'all, it asks you like five times, do you really want to delete this course? But if you delete your course, contact your Canvas admin, you can get it back. Okay. So just because something gets deleted, don't freak out. It'll come back. With a new rich content editor, there is an auto save for any of your work. Uh, um, so you have some of those built in things, but just be aware of that. But that undelete right there will bring back the deleted item 
So that's right there. The um, message student two and the new rich content editor with edit the auto save um, is really nice. And what I mean by the auto save is, My name schemes are great here. I know. Okay, so auto save. So I'm sitting here working. Okay, so you first have your your page. You're good. You feel good about it. You're then you go back in, and let's say you're adding an image going to use dog again just because I know safeties on the webinar. Okay, so I have that, but I accidentally back out. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to leave it. I'm done. Well, then next time you go in, it's going to say, oh, wait a second. You didn't save this the last time that you were in there. Are you sure? No, no, no. That's, that's what I want. Okay, so the auto save is built in for you, um, and now you can save it. So that's a, a nice little trick <laughs> if you ever forget how to do some things. Um, some things that I am providing for you guys, because I know we don't have a ton of time today. Um, and I wanna make sure that I leave it open for you guys to have asked all the questions you wanna ask is I do have a course checklist. And this checklist is what I give to my teachers at the beginning of every year. Um, and so on this checklist, you guys have access to it is it's literally, these are the seven steps to get your course ready. That's it. Like you start with, here's, make sure your course is published, set up your side navigations, import um, your categories from Power Teacher Pro, import, and if you already have a Canvas course, how to import your stuff over so you can make a copy of it, validate your links, um, make sure your modules are published. And then of course, because we, we are a Google district, with the new integration and like go back and check, make sure all your integrations are working. Um, so this is just a little step-by-step, -step, hey, do these seven things before you call me. <laughs> um, no, but that's, I mean, it's just helpful for them to go, okay, it's not overwhelming at the beginning of the year. If I do these things, I'm gonna be successful. Um, so those are just some options there. Uh, another thing that I have at for you guys is it's kind of my overall master slide deck. I pull from this quite a bit. Um, nope, it's not that. I'll link it the right one. Um, it has a ton of stuff, including outcomes and more information on rubrics. Um, and I'll get that added in shortly. I'll replace that link. It'll be the right link for you guys. Uh, but all of that is in there for you so that even if we didn't cover it in today's session, like, like uh, mastery pass, it's basically, I don't know if anybody, but it's my, my canvas Bible. It's everything I know about canvas. It's all in one place. So I will put that, that link in there for you guys. Okay. So that kind of sums up where we are at, but I do want to have pause and take time for questions, but I do know that folks also have lots of busy lives. So I've updated the slide deck so that you can um, scan your code and everything. But now I'm just going to pause and turn it over to you all. What questions do you still have about Canvas that I have not answered? Um, I saw about the slide deck. I'll, I'll put out a, a where you can make a copy link. Um, what other questions do you guys have that I can answer during this time? And feel free to unmute yourself if you're more comfortable with that. Do you know when they're supposed to, um, I have like 11 classes, but they don't have the people in there. And is that a, a, a county thing when they're going to um, allow us to start like putting information into our courses and stuff? Yes. So um, as a as a Canvas admin, I'll tell you this, um, each each district sets theirs up. Um, I Again, I'm more of a liberal, I guess, admin than most. Um, all my teachers will have their courses populate for them. Or they're already there, but they can see their courses starting August 2nd. Um, so some districts just are strict when you can view them. The best thing you can do is build in a sandbox. And I tell my teachers this at the end of every year, like if you know you're going to be teaching biology next year, build on that during the summer. So when you come back, all you gotta do is copy your stuff over. 
So I always, I always leave live sandboxes with no students in there for my teachers so that they can build what they want to. But your district will, as soon as your courses go um, live for you, then everything will populate over. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, so I see a question. Um, are we talking about, Michelle, in new quizzes or in classic quizzes? So right now, I think my district only has classic quizzes, but this question comes from me teaching only virtual last year. And so um, I would create a CUDA software sheet and make it multiple choice. And then they would have as much time as they wanted to do that for say a quiz or a worksheet or whatever. And they would go input their answers into Canvas. And so I would make question number one, A, B, C, or D. And what I wanted to do was duplicate just question one, nine other times and rename it as two through 10 and then change the answers to that. So they could go back and, you know, redo that quiz as many times as they wanted to get their answers right. But I was finding that I was going to have to make question number two. And then, you know, when I had a larger worksheet that would have several tens of questions, then I would just have to keep making those questions over and over again. Is there a way to duplicate one question repeatedly? Yes. So um, I'm, I'm just making one right now. So see what I just, I just made a question in new quizzes and you can write beside the pencil. There's a duplicate. It's only in new quizzes. It is not in classic quizzes. Thank you. No problem. So hence why new quizzes is better. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Sylvania, you said, is there an easier way to exempt your new students from previous assignments in Canvas so that a zero isn't transferred to PowerSchool? All right, so in PowerSchool, um, uh, you can look at your gradebook and just do for just by the nine weeks okay so when you look at nine weeks you're gonna have to go back and manually exempt and that's a pain but it's just for that nine weeks if you're looking at uh let me go somewhere where i have data hold on So when you're looking at your grade book, you can, um, when you do view, you can actually do it by quarter and your previous quarter should be locked. So like that, none of the first nine weeks stuff will transfer back. So you shouldn't have to worry about if they come in second nine weeks, the first nine weeks. Okay. Um, but when they come in, then you do want to exempt them, um, for each one. And I hate to say it, but yeah, it is a, like, it's just a, you can type EX and just kind of go down the row. Or you can do oops. Go back. Come on. All right, so then you can kind of go do the individual view and just do like an EX for all of them, but that'll exempt them. Um, that's the only way that I know of at this point in time to make it work. All right, so I got the question marks. All right, what other questions do you guys have? All right, well, I will be sticking around for a little bit longer. Um, if you have questions or, you know, you're kind of like, this may just apply to me, feel free to ask those. Um, for those who have joined us and are going to be departing, it was a pleasure. Um, if you have other colleagues that you feel like this session would be great, I am going to rerun this session or repeat again um, at two o'clock today. So thanks, guys. I'm going to stop recording.